Ladies and gentlemen, we're live here on Make It Plain with our brother. He's a former intelligence official for over 30 years. He's been a counterterrorism expert, intelligence community member. He's been deployed to intelligence operations in the Balkans, Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, the author of The Plot to Hack America, Hacking ISIS, also the New York Times bestseller, Defeating ISIS. We welcome back to Make It Plain. He was in Ukraine for a month, and he joins us now. We're happy to have him, our brother, Malcolm Nance. Hey, man, how are you? I'm tired, man. <laughs> sure you are. You're making the rounds, I see. Yeah, I'm, I'm tired. I'm doing the media rounds, and um, I'm glad people are starting to listen. Because for a long time, it was, you know, certainly for a month, it was a fait accompli, according to most media, that Ukraine was going to be invaded. It was going to be a very short war. The Ukrainians would be defeated rather quickly, and the Russians would take over the country. Now we're past when U.S. intelligence first assessed that Kiev would fall. Now, I've spoken to, to other officials since that time, and they say on day seven, it's not even going to be close. <laughs> I mean, this, this country is not collapsing. And what's actually happening is that a factor that I noticed wasn't being covered in news media is now coming to bite everyone on the butt. And that is the Ukrainian army, the 250,000 men and women who serve in uniform in Ukraine for almost two months, you couldn't see anything about the Ukrainian army on the TV screen. Uh, you would see them down in Donetsk, where I was at, the, you know, the, the southern southeastern battlefront. But no one was talking anything about that. So people thought the Russians were just going to walk in and win. And now we are finding out that there is a lot of fight in this army. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we've even seen Russians surrendering, haven't we? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of Russians surrendering, and principally because they've, you know, the, the aggressive strategy that the Russians put for them to move their armor, mechanized infantry out very quickly, they ran out of gas. And while they were running out of gas, Ukrainian drones and uh, anti-tank teams with rockets and Stinger missiles we're blowing up their fuel supply, their, their supply train. So you literally have T-80 tanks breaking down, their, their principal main battle tank, Break, not breaking down, just stopping on the highway because they have nothing, you know, they have no fuel. There's a funny video where a guy pulls up next to a, a, a BRD, you know, or a BMP-1 armored personnel carrier, and he yells at him, he goes, hey, what's the matter? Are you broken down? And they go, no, we're out of fuel. He goes, do you want a tow? And he goes, I'll give you a tow back to Moscow. <laughs> but what we are finding is, is that the Russian, the vaunted Russian army is falling back on its fundamental Soviet roots. They are not as professional as we thought. They are not, they're well equipped, but that doesn't mean anything when the people that you're fighting want to uh, kick your butt with every fiber of their being. And many of these Russians didn't know they were actually invading Ukraine. They thought that they were on an exercise in Belarus or southern Russia. And, you know, they go to a gas station. This actually happened. And, and the, the locals were like, what the hell are you doing here? And these guys are like, we want coffee, you know. <laughs> you know, and they're, they're like, you're in, you know, why are people shooting at us? And they go, you're in Ukraine. He goes, we're not supposed to be in Ukraine. We're supposed to be exercising. They didn't even know they were on a combat mission. Only the senior leaders and the brigade and battalion commanders, some of the senior NCOs knew what the real objectives were. And now it is a, a, it is a mistake that is coming to roost. And they are, the main army is moving so slow, not in the Southeast down near Crimea because they don't have a lot of resistance, but in the rest of the country around Kharkiv, around Sumy, around Chernihiv and Kiev, they're just finding out there is an army that is out to kill them. So conceivably, you're saying, uh, uh, Malcolm, the Ukraine Ukrainians could win this war against Russia. You know, is and, and this, this is interesting because 
Uh, I'm the only national security analyst that has said this. Uh, I said this last night on MSNBC that I'm going to I'm going to put my marker down based on what I saw while I was there. Um, you know, I went to the Donetsk battlefront. I went to Adovica along with the other press pool people. However, as a former warfighter and an intelligence uh, professional, I look at things differently than journalists. I don't care how good a journalist you are. If you have never fought in combat, you have never served in the armed forces, you can't evaluate a force very well. I mean, it's like it's like saying, you know, taking somebody who is a, a, a travel writer and, you know, putting them in charge of writing about the Pentagon, you know, the next day, well, all you see is lots of people, lots of ships, and it all looks very imposing. That doesn't mean that you can actually evaluate their capacity. So many of these journalists, a lot of combat veteran journalists who've been to Afghanistan, Iraq, they really don't understand, unless you're a practitioner, just how bad it can get. Another thing is mother nature, had a say in this battle. The Russians really thought that it was going to be a typical Ukrainian winter where temperatures are down below as, as cold as minus 20. Well, here in upstate New York, we've reached minus 17 in January. When I got to Kiev in late January, the temperatures there, there was light snow on the ground, but the temperatures there were in the high 20s, low 30s. Uh, by the time I got to the second week, the temperature had moved into the mid-30s all day. The third week, they moved into the mid-40s. Last week before I left, we reached 50 degrees in Ukraine. This is unheard of. This is not natural. It has made a mud pit out of the frozen ground the Russians thought that they would be driving on. Uh, and there's a there's a famous video piece that's out yesterday of a Russian T-80 tank stuck completely all the way up to the top, almost to the turret, in mud, and they took a very large artillery piece, put a cable on it, and was trying to tow it out of the mud, and the artillery piece got stuck. And of course, the Ukrainian army was coming, so they're just guys with rifles. The tank means nothing when you can't maneuver, right? You're just going to burn up and die. So they abandoned the tank and the artillery piece, which are now going to be towed out and put in Ukrainian army service. The T-80 is one of the most advanced tanks in the world. Not, you know, uh, so if you can't even get out of the mud, if Mother Nature is defeating you, that means you are forced to be on the highways. And if anybody who served in Iraq or Afghanistan knows... The most dangerous place you could be in those countries is on a road. Why is that, Malcolm? More MIP after this message. Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save money on your insurance? Of course you would. After all, who wouldn't love a great deal, right? And when it comes to great rates on insurance for all of the things in your life, Geico can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners, condo, or renters coverage. You could save even more with a special discount when you bundle your coverages. Plus, add the easy-to-use Geico mobile app, available 24-hour roadside assistance, and more. And choosing to switch to Geico becomes an easy choice. Switch to and see all the ways you could save with great rates and discounts. It's easy. Simply go to geico.com to get a rate quote or contact your local agent and get started seeing how much you could save. Well, because well, this because- master channelizes you. Even though you may have the shock effect of having armor, mechanized infantry, you still got to be bring fuel trucks. You still have to have a logistics bridgehead. You have to have a place where your ammunition is going to be bought forward to you as you're shooting and fighting. If you're along, like you've heard about this 17, at uh, this three mile road, which is about six kilometers. Well, that road, uh, that armor column that they're talking about in the media today has now stretched out to 17 kilometers as the tank forces move forward. Well, if you're a good resistance force with professional soldiers and a whole bunch of, you know, men with rifles and anti-tank rockets, sure, you would have a unit attack them at the front with javelin missiles and blow up the lead tank, slow down the advance. But all you have to do is get into your you know, pickup truck or your car 
drive parallel to that road, get out about a kilometer behind those tanks, and now you're in the mid middle of the logistics chain. And you start blowing up, not tanks. You don't even have to use your big anti-tank rockets. You save those for tanks. Use your machine guns. Use your RPG-7s, and you start blowing up the fuel tanks that those tanks are going to run out of fuel in a couple of hours. And I mean hours. It's gallons to the mile for tanks, not miles to the gallon. So, you know, it's usually about, for most military trucks, it's about five gallons to the mile. For a tank, it, depending on the weight of the tank, most of these are 60-ton main battle tanks, could be as high as 10 gallons to the mile of diesel, right? Now, you turn around while you're taking on the front, you look behind you, and your entire logistics train of fuel is burning because they're hitting it with drones. They're hitting with MiG-29 airstrikes. The few helicopters they have left are shooting it. And now here comes a bunch of Ukrainians who really hate you, okay, coming out of the woods and now destroying your dinner, destroying your fuel and killing every soldier that they have. That road, I make a prediction tonight. That road's going to look like the old Death Valley Highway of Death did in Iraq in 2001, where you had, you know, hundreds of armored vehicles stretched out on a road. They think they're doing a big military push. They have created the largest ambush kill zone in history, quite possibly. That, that's we that, don't, that, we're calling them and telling them, right? I mean, they know they know it. And U.S. intelligence has been putting this out. Ukrainians know it. They're already up there. And, you know, if you want a good analogy, if you don't know Death Valley, go watch the movie Last of the Mohicans. And there's a scene where the British surrender to the French and the French allow them to leave with their weapons. And they get into a field, all 200 of them, and they are slaughtered by Indians from every side. That actually happened, you know, in American history, British history. That's what's going to happen to these Russian tankers. Wow. So what, obviously, if you know this, Putin has to know it. Or what, are they getting some totally different intelligence than what you're getting? I mean, what, what are they, is this, is this just foolhardiness or what? I, I think there's a factor of, of, unreality in the way that they see war. You know, they think I'm going to drop two, three thousand tanks in there to an assault force that looks like very heavy shock armor. But tanks are no good without infantry on their feet out of their armored personnel carriers, protecting the flanks from machine guns and seizing ground and terrain. Right. I mean, you saw it in Iraq, Afghanistan. We, we put our people out on the ground. Or you have to be on the ground. Otherwise, some kid with a Molotov cocktail can take it and throw it right down the hatch, set fire to your men and blow up ammunition. That's happened to us. So we are better at combat integration and using the mass of that armor with mechanized infantry, controlling zones, deploying troops at critical points so that you move forward and leapfrog or with this shock wall that goes out and blast enemy tanks, blast enemy emplacements. But you can't do it if you have nobody behind you because all they'll do is let you drive by, right? And your gun is pointed forward and your machine guns are looking around and they'll just rocket you from the back. And now you stop and every tank behind you is stopped. And then they'll go behind the next tank. Um, this is just fundamentals of urban warfare. But these columns are trying to come into the city of Kiev. They've made no progress, the Russians, in the last five days of getting into Kiev. They've done two assaults with special forces, and they got pretty far into the northern side of town on Bahameni Boulevard, which I was quite surprised when I saw the Russian forces on that boulevard near the, near the, um, the Kiev Zoo, uh, because... When I remember driving down that road, and this is why I went to Ukraine, so I can feel the combat environment, I can understand it. You have the zoo in the park to your left. It's all trees, and it's lower than you. It's sloping lower than you. But that's where you're going to have guys with rockets, right, in the trees. But to your right, you have two, three, and ten-story apartment blocks looking down on your boulevard. It's a massacre. It's a kill zone. And the only thing I can think of is the Ukrainians allowed them to come where they were, blocked them, and wiped them out. 
and they were Ukrainian. They were special forces. They were Russian special forces. Uh, and that's two days ago. You saw the journalists had misinterpreted what had happened. They were saying there's gunfighting inside of Kiev. Yeah, there's gunfighting in Kiev, but Kiev is the size, physically the size of Chicago with far more 20 story concrete block apartment buildings than Chicago does. And they ring the city because they're Soviet style, right? They put like 20,000 people per complex. Uh, You know, you can get into the city a little, but you're not gonna survive it. And that's what I think the Russians thought they were gonna run in there, do an, you know, do a um, operation Iraqi freedom, you know, defeat the Ukrainian forces on the move. But the Russians don't have the military savvy, the technology savvy, the combat integration savvy, and they definitely do. Most of these regular army guys, they don't apparently want to be in Ukraine. You know who wants to be in Ukraine? The Ukrainians. And the Ukrainians, as far as they're concerned, they like the video that one guy put out. He goes, you're going to come into, he says, you got 100,000 men. You're going to come into a city of 5 million people. We're going to be throwing Molotov cocktails all over you, you know. So the Russians may have underestimated this. So, you know, one last thing, you know, they say it's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. This is a perfect example of it. The Ukrainians want them to attack. They are desperate for them to attack. They have bloodlust in their eyes. And they're destroying their city. So, you know, they've got a lot of payback that they want to get out of these Russians. More MIP after this message. So what about this? Help us understand, if any, the relationship between Putin doing this now versus him not doing it when Trump was in office. Is is that something worth looking at? Well, when you think about it, Vladimir Putin knew a lot of things we didn't know. Okay, this is a former director of the KGB. His client in Ukraine uh, back in 2014 or 2013 and 14, when Trump was running for president or starting to think about running for president, his client was his vassal, uh, the leader of Ukraine, who was Viktor Yanukovych, who was won in a election that was a little bit engineered by Moscow, but he won an election. Uh, Yanukovych refused to adhere to the the mandates of the people. The people wanted to align themselves with the European Union, become Western, not ally themselves with Moscow. Yanukovych worked for Putin. So, of course, he was aligning himself with Moscow. When the referendum on their alignment with the European Union came and he banned it, right, he refused to sign the treaty. That's when everybody went up in arms and they had what was called the Orange Revolution or the Revolution of Dignity down in Maidan Square. He unleashed the secret police at Putin's behest, killed over 100 protesters, and then they really bought it to him to the point where he abandoned the country. Putin seemed to think that if he did this invasion, Zelensky would just go to the airport, get in an executive jet and fly to Poland. Zelensky is a Ukrainian. And he's made of way tougher stuff. Zelensky is now photographed with his body armor and his helmet on, essentially throwing the bird at the Russians and telling them, you're going to have to kill me and my own capital with his boys out there on the battlefront, looking like a hero, has now become a global icon of resistance to Vladimir Putin. The Russians cannot defeat their will if their will says We are going to kill you no matter what it takes. So I use the phrase uh, at first amusingly. Now I use it seriously. These people will become the white Taliban of Europe. And I don't mean like the Chechens. These people will dedicate their waking moment day and night to killing whoever Russian soldier is unfortunate enough to have to stand out at a checkpoint at night on some lonely crossroad or a tank will get blowed up in the middle of the night. So, you know, like I said, Russia might be able to cut off parts of the Ukrainian army or push them back. I don't think they'll take the country at all. So Malcolm Nance, will this escalate into a 
all out World War Three. Will the United States have to get involved? Do you think? No. no, no okay. No. I mean, because, because because Ukraine, as you're saying, Ukraine uh, is strong. Yeah, right? you saw what you saw what Putin did yesterday or last night, where he elevated the elevated the threshold of the nuclear deterrent forces of Russia, right? The the ballistic missile force, or they call it the strategic rocket force of 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 Russia. That's because Putin is sweating bullets about what's happening in Ukraine. And I suspect, even though in some places he's made good progress down in the south, but trying to take the major city of Kharkiv, the city of Sumy, the city of Chernihiv, uh, and Kiev, they're going horribly, horribly slow. And that's where we're seeing them run out of fuel. That's where we're seeing massive ambushes. That's where we're seeing soldiers surrender. And oh, and an interesting one, he kept leading with his special forces. So he brought in an element from uh, from Belarus of Chechen, Chechen Muslim special forces who are allied with Putin. Do you remember that scene in the movie 300 where they bring out the immortals, right? The black robes and the mask and they, you know, assassins that come in the night. Yeah, that's who the Chechen special forces were. And they took uh, an air base called Hostomil, Hostomil, uh, which was the airport of the Antonov, air, uh, Antonov Airplane Company. Largest transports in the world, those giant Russian transports. Well, they blew them up taking that airport, the Russians. And um, they brought these forces in. And in a counterattack, the Ukrainians slaughtered them all and killed Putin's handpicked major general, ruthless Chechen murderer, who was the commander of that force, was killed in combat yesterday. And now they're making videos on TikTok taunting them, saying, we killed your boy. This is, these guys, these are just militia men and regular soldiers are taking on the best that the Russians have and are winning. Lastly, Malcolm, I know you got to go. How, how long do you think this is going to last? A lot longer than people. I mean, get in for the long ride. I think the Ukrainian army has enough guts and capacity and has been reserving themselves that they in certain areas will allow the Russians to stretch themselves out and feel confident in their advance. But behind that column of armored tanks, which you can hold down with American Javelin missiles, behind them is a lot of trucks of food, fuel, ammunition. The The one thing about the Russians we're seeing is they don't maneuver well. They don't go to the right and to the left. They don't flank very well. They hit you with brute force. So they're like a boxer that's constantly punching right at your arms and your face. Like, you know, Yago Drago or whatever, it is, Ivan Drago or Rocky, right? You know, and Rocky's more of a dancer, a finesser. That's what we're looking for from the Ukrainian army. And I think in a couple of days when the Russian invasion lines are going down some major highways and it looks like they're going to approach from the east and take the Dnipro River, which which cut Kiev off, I suspect you're going to find the Ukrainian army is going to maneuver, cut behind them and start slaughtering some people who were thinking they're just there that night to cook food for those tanks that are 20 kilometers up the road. And the tanks are going to go, oh, my God, the enemy's in our rear. And now you find yourself surrounded. So, you know, people say the Russians will be surrounding a lot of these 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 forces. Well, I'm going to quote you what the commander of the Ukrainian forces told me down in Donetsk in Adavitsa. He's a short, pugnacious major general. And, he's, and a, a news crew asked him, well, you're down here and you're facing the Russians 200 meters away in, in Donetsk and Luhansk. Well, what happens if they attack up near Kiev? What happens if they attack near Kharkiv? What happens if they attack near Sumy or down south near Odessa? And this guy goes, I don't care what direction they attack from. I'm going to fight them. Well, you know, that harks back to the, the Battle of Chosin Reservoir in Korea War, where they surrounded all these Marines. And the Marine general goes, well, great. Now I can attack in any direction. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, how do you beat that guy? Right. He's looking forward to attacking you and you're just trying to survive your forward momentum. I think there's this bad. This war could go on, even if Russia takes Kiev, which I, you know, they could possibly surround it and wear it down and they make a tactical withdrawal. But I don't think they will survive the country and the country will be 
blowing up roadside bombs like the Iraqis and the Afghanis so that the most dangerous thing a Russian can do is to get in a vehicle because that's what it was for us in Iraq and Afghanistan. Get in a vehicle and get on the road and you pretty much could be signing your death warrant. What does it say about Fox News and other entities that are kind of promoting this? I mean, and showing uh, support I, for Putin. Yeah, the, yeah I, call them, I, call them, I just straight I just up call them fifth columnists now. They're fifth columnists. These are people who work in the interest of a foreign power. And they do not work in the interest of what's actually happening here. This is not about NATO. This is not about imperialism. You know, you hear a lot of people on the left say we're anti-imperialist. That's pure imperialism you're looking at there with Russia invading Ukraine. You could say Iraq, Afghanistan, these things had imperialistic tendencies. It isn't as pure as this coming in and saying we are going to kill everyone in the government. Uh, that's what they call denazification, right? a Jewish government, and then say, we are also going to disarm the Ukrainians. That means you're going to kill everyone in the Ukrainian army. So that's your objective. That's not it. This is a war between an autocrat like Donald Trump, right? Donald Trump was a Putin lackey autocrat who found the laws of the United States stopped him uh, from, from, you know, extra legally overthrowing an election. And it was only our goodwill that saved us. Putin, on the other hand, he is about to find out. I mean, he's a dictator, straight up dictator. And he is terrified that Ukraine is a functioning democracy who has had six presidents in the 30 years that he's been president and will be president for life. That is what this war is about. It's about democracy at Russia's foot at doorstep and he has decided he's going to wipe it out I suspect he might be quite surprised how much of his army he loses Malcolm Nance um, intelligence expert um, in service to our country for over 30 years we're thankful for that service and uh, took the trip to Ukraine to bring all this information back to us I know he'll be looking at it more closely and this won't be the last we'll hear from him follow him on Twitter at Malcolm Nance. Thank you, brother. My pleasure. Thanks for getting woke and listening to Make It Plain. Please remember to listen, like, and wherever you get your podcasts, please give the show a five-star rating. And please do spread the word. Let's all continue to pray for each other during this pandemic and this police-demic. If all hearts and minds are clear, it has been Make It Plain.